And welcome to session two of Global Sources Virtual Summit for Online Sellers, brought to you by SellerX and Gemba. I'm your host, Megla Bhardwaj, and I am joined by my co-host, Karen in Hong Kong. Hi, Karen. How are you doing? Hi. Great. Hello, everyone. We're back. <laughs> We're back, yes, just after a couple of hours. We were live for like four and a half hours this morning. That's a really long yes. time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we we have this session and then two more sessions to go after this one. A lot of learning exactly. to do. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm super excited about this session because we're talking about drones. <laughs> drones, they're yeah. one of my favorite objects out there. And so we've got a very exciting presentation um, from Michael Curry talking about the automation of global supply chains. And then we've got uh, Carla from Seller X is gonna be talking about how to build and scale your e-commerce business. And uh, then we've also got Seller X um, uh, Fang Yi coming in and talking about Seller X. And then we've got prizes that we're gonna be giving away at the end of the session. So guys, stick with us until the end. And um, uh, Karen, what about the suppliers? What kinds of suppliers do you have? Which countries, what products? Tell us about that. Yeah, we have um, suppliers from around the world in this session. We have some from India, Vietnam, and China selling um, tech stuff, um, eco-friendly stuff all that you can think of. So stay for them and see if they fit your market. Exactly, super excited. And I'm really interested in the uh, supplier from India that does eco-friendly products and um, eco accessories in India, I think their name is. So I think that's a big niche that people are really you know, wanting to do nowadays. So that's gonna be yes. a very interesting supplier for sure. And we also have oh, an eco-friendly yeah. supplier from Vietnam as well. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So everybody watching, um, first of all, let us know where you're joining us from. It'd be interesting to see where people are uh, joining us from for this afternoon session. In the morning session, we had people from all over the U.S., Australia, Africa, um, Europe, so um, Philippines. And we've got Emma Zion, who's joined us again. Super excited for this another session. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the first session this morning. So let us know where you're from. And also, if you're watching on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, give us a like. And if you're on Facebook, share the video and let your uh, friends also know about this. That would be much appreciated. So we've got Erwin watching from Sydney. Hi, Erwin. How are you doing Hi, there? Erwin. All right. So, Karen, uh, I'm going to get started yes. with Michael, and then I will see you in about um, 30 minutes, 30 actually, minutes. right after Michael's presentation. So, yeah. Be ready yes, with your okay. suppliers. <laughs> yeah, see you in a bit. All right, see ya. Bye. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to invite our first guest, Michael Curry from Fling. Hi, Michael. How are you doing? Hi, Migla. How are you? I'm doing great. It is awesome to see you again, Michael. And uh, I am super interested in your presentation. Um, can, are you able to hear me okay, Michael? I can hear you. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. You're good now. You, you were frozen for a bit, but I think you're good now. Oh. Okay. So I, I, yes, just uh, let me know if I have any problems, but okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're good now. So Michael, let's get started with your presentation. You're going to be talking about drones and you have a very cool video to show. So um, let's get started. Do you want to, uh, let me just share your screen and yep, here we go. So we can see your slides. Do you want to just uh, switch to your slides and your screen? Right. Perfect. Over to you, Michael. Thank you so much. Well, thanks to Global Sources again for uh, inviting me to uh, speak about uh, warehouse uh, and supply chain automation, which I think is an interesting topic uh, for your audience. Um, now, I myself, I'm the CEO of Fling, which is based in Bangkok in Thailand here in Asia. And uh, my background is as a software developer in, um, in uh, North America for many years. And then as well, I was executive director of a Google-backed research group called OpenWorld. Um, so I'm here today to talk about what I've titled the, the long tail of automation in the global supply chain. So um, for the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes, I'll be discussing um, different automation strategies and then uh, 
at the end of my remarks, I'll talk about the specific solution that, uh, that Fling, my company, specializes in, which is, uh, as Megla was mentioning, uh, drones. Okay, so first I'll be speaking in a more general context about automation. So I think uh, many of you already understand, especially those of you who uh, interact with or are perhaps uh, in fact involved in warehousing, um, understand that it's a very competitive marketplace um, and decision makers in those uh, warehouses really uh, have an imperative to improve efficiency as much as possible. Um, and what we've seen over the decades from when warehouses were a much more casual affair um, with, with far less systemizing uh, of the, uh, the processes, um, repetitive tasks like picking and packing have already been automated. This has already been captured by um, really the, the automations that took place with uh, reach trucks, scissor lifts that have been available now for uh, several decades. And obviously that's way more efficient than asking you know, teams of human beings to move large pallets around. So now we're in what I like to call a long tail, which is a, a, a shorter um, in magnitude, but nevertheless uh, high impact uh, complex tasks, which have yet to be automated for many warehouses. Now, some warehouses, yes, have adopted a, a nearly fully automated approach, but only warehouses with a certain uh, scale, and I'll discuss the, which types of warehouses uh, uh, make sense for automation uh, in my later slides. Um, but it, it really, uh, only certain types of warehouses have uh, so far been able to justify that degree of automation. Um, and really that leads us into the question of um, how to uh, discuss the benefits and uh, costs and how those trade off for different automation solutions. So if we really drill into the uh, profit and loss statement of a warehouse, um, we see that they typically have five to 10% uh, margins um, if they're broken out as a separate business unit at all in a, perhaps a larger uh, company. And um, when we're talking about large distribution centers, um, these might be uh, uh, you know, little mini businesses in and of themselves um, with 80 to 100 employees and obviously very large real estate footprint uh, taken up perhaps 10 to, to 30 to even 40,000 square meters uh, footprint. And, and yet a lot of that uh, cost um, is uh, coming from payroll. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the staff size might be in, in around the 100 range and a major portion of their cost is going to be simply to pay their workers, even here in Asia, where costs are relatively uh, lower. Um, we, we do find that the, the payroll costs end up um, being larger than you might expect, because although the per hour cost is perhaps relatively low compared to a country like just let's pick a country in Europe like Germany or Switzerland. Um, obviously the, the hourly cost is lower uh, for labor, but the um, turnover rate is gonna be higher, the cost for training, the um, issues with um, uh, errors and, and other issues uh, are really crop up there and reliability. Um, so there's still a significant cost there for payroll. And then the other uh, second largest cost is facility rental, which, as I mentioned, has to do with the large real estate footprint that these uh, warehouses um, typically have. Um, so um, if we look at those costs, really the, the imperative of the, of the warehouse manager is to drive those costs down. And um, so if we look at holistically how a warehouse operates, um, we can see here this um, cycle that takes place on a daily basis inside the warehouse from packing to shipping, uh, replenishing the goods inside the warehouse, um, uh, dealing with uh, reverse logistics or returns. Um, there's also sortation and put away uh, when the goods actually arrive at the warehouse there. And so all of this uh, really um, is um, potential for uh, automation. Um, and you see that all these items are potentially linked with software here, the warehouse management system. Um, in fact, the ultimate vision here is what we call lights out warehousing that operates totally autonomously. Um, and for that, uh, you know, you can imagine uh, 
uh, you know, that warehouse that you saw in a Star Wars movie where there's no human beings at all. And it's just, you know, robots moving things around and uh, products uh, come out one end and raw materials are, are coming in the other. Um, that's uh, the ultimate vision here uh, to, to lower that payroll cost down as, as low as possible. Um, although other costs uh, still will exist, um, to the enabling technologies to, to even approach that sort of uh, level of automation involve things like um, obviously WMS technology to track and keep track of where everything is. Um, but you're also uh, talking about not just employing uh, vehicles for moving packages around and pallets around, but also um, automating those vehicles so they're moving around autonomously. So that those are what we call AGVs, automated guided vehicles um, and uh, palletizers. Um, there's also the potential for an even um, more complex automation using ASRS or automated storage and retrieval, where uh, not only are the products being moved around, but also uh, the entire racking system is dedicated to a, uh, an automation. And then of course, um, uh, what, what Fling is famous for, which is the UAVs for inventory cycle counting, which is most important in warehouses that are uh, less structured. ASRS type warehouses really are already tracking everything in the warehouse quite effectively. All right, so um, to sort of explicitly look at what a long tail looks like here, we're talking about um, at an early stage um, in terms of degree of um, complexity and specialization, um, things like reach trucks, scissor lifts, uh, racking systems, and all of this has a um, potential to um, work in virtually every uh, warehouse. Whereas when you um, move into more sophisticated solutions like ASRS, uh, AGVs, um, RFID systems, um, these sorts of uh, more uh, complex solutions require a uh, fixed investment of um, upfront time for figuring out how to lay it out in the warehouse. Um, also, of course, there's the, just the, the capital cost of purchasing the equipment. And um, all of that can only be justified in warehouses that either have a high degree of goods velocity or a high value of the individual products. Um, just to take an example, I was recently in a, an FMCG warehouse uh, close to Bangkok here in Thailand, and I was asking them, well, why, why, won't, why don't you uh, use RFID? I mean, that would be a great way to keep track of all these items. It was a 30,000 square meter, uh, double deep, double stack uh, warehouse. And the warehouse manager was telling me, well, you know, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense because we're, we're packing things like shampoo bottles and, you know, deodorant, and the profit margin on each of those individual items is on the order of, you know, a few pennies. And so if we, even if we add a, um, a very cheap passive RFID uh, chip, which is only um, you know, 20 cents, that's still blowing through our profit margin on the item um, when you get right to the retail stage. So a lot of automations might look good in a newspaper article or in a video, but you really have to justify them when you, um, when you look at the actual costs and the benefits. So just to, again, maybe have a more um, uh, complex or a more strategic, let's say, enumeration of the various types of automations, um, let's kind of divide them into software and hardware here. So the software side at the top in uh, the green color is what we call digital process automation. And at the bottom there in orange, physical process automation. So you see how they all, um, uh, get linked together um, by uh, technology. So on the digital side, we have uh, just using smartphones and tablets, um, things like uh, the Keyence um, or Cognex uh, barcode reading systems, moving on to using, um, using the internet, uh, software applications linked together with APIs, cloud databases, machine learning, and then finally into data platforms that manage the whole process. So all of that is really linked to the physical automations that are possible inside of a warehouse, including robotics, um, goods to person systems, uh, the kind of 
you know, very sophisticated ASRS racking systems. And, and then the, the things that you see, um, you know, uh, moving around in an Amazon or Alibaba warehouse, AGVs buzzing around the floor, moving uh, goods around and bringing them close to, uh, close to people uh, for the sortation. Um, so with all this, you know, menu of technology available, really um, the options available to a warehouse manager and decision maker are really quite, um, quite intimidating. There's really a lot of decisions to be made here about what direction to go in the competitive landscape. Um, so just to maybe take a pictorial tour of what this kind of uh, uh, menu of technologies looks like. Here's a reach truck, um, especially for those of you who don't work in a warehouse every day. This is what it looks like. You go up high and you pick the whole pallet up and then move it over to the, um, the area where it will get moved away. This is typically operated by humans, but uh, more and more these days, companies like DHL, uh, even here in Thailand and others are experimenting with, um, with completely automated uh, reach trucks. Um, and then you've got these AGVs, which tend to move um, sort of smaller uh, type items around. Uh, here's this Amazon Robotics, which was um, uh, acquired uh, uh, from a previous startup that was working about 10 years ago in this field. These are very famous. Um, and then you've got some more some renderings of what this might look like in the future with a, the fully uh, robotic solution. These are more fanciful type illustrations here. Um, uh, and uh, you've also got um, these ASRS systems where everything is autom automated, uh, racking and, and everything. Now for a warehouse like this to work in a, in a profitable way, you really have to have very, very high um, goods velocity in the warehouse, meaning a lot of goods have to turn over uh, a lot to justify the, the fixed and upfront a, a cost of introducing a system like this. Um, and then you get this very complex type of system here. I mean, I think you, we, we've all been familiar with, with uh, uh, complex systems like this at airports. At an airport, you're gonna get this kind of complexity uh, and it's justified by the, uh, the number of items that have to move around. Here in a warehouse, um, it can sometimes be justified if uh, especially if you're not um, working with full pallets, but you're breaking them up. If it's a warehouse that's a, not just a distribution center, but also moving goods around. Okay. So if you're going to implement automation in a warehouse, you really need to take a structured approach. So you want to first identify what is your current status? What are the types of goods? How many SKUs are you dealing with? You want to assess these options. So this is partly what I'm what I'm here to present today. What are some options available? Um, and then you want to really devise. So in terms of metrics, what is the goal you are trying to achieve? So is this about um, reducing the uh, cost per location in the warehouse, uh, cost per unique location? Is this about um, reducing your headcount? Is it about um, uh, at dealing with um, the, uh, the customer for a 3PL, um, are you going to improve their ROI? There's a lot of different metrics that could be assigned here at this stage, and it's very important to determine that in advance so you have some basis to evaluate the success of your, your automation. And here at Fling, we're very excited to work with um, our customers on that because it allows them to really justify the, the cost of the system that I'm about to show you. And then, of course, you want to execute and then iterate. So you're not done after you, you do one um, automation exercise. You really want to um, uh, take small steps, potentially, if the capital cost isn't too high, take small steps and iterate to improve over time. With the auto ultimate goal, as I keep saying, eventually, in the future, potentially, complete automation if the velocity can justify. Okay. So I'm just going to uh, ask Megla to please uh, switch over to our, our video here, just to get a little taste of um, the automation that Fling um, offers to warehouses. And I'll talk about that after. Thank you. OK, let me just play the video.
There are 150,000 warehouses in the world underpinning the global supply chain. All of them must conduct periodic inventory counts. We are a team of AI and drone experts, and we're here to revolutionize inspection in the supply chain and energy industries. The user inputs the area of the warehouse they want scanned. Our proprietary software launches the drone, flying it without GPS, using fiducial markers attached to rack services. The drone photographs every pallet and uploads this information to our web portal. Our AI also identifies spoiled or missing items and misaligned pallets. Let's make the future of inspection. Thanks so much. I think you can switch back over to my slides. I have about four more to go and then I'll wrap things up. Thanks. Okay, so it just, I think it's useful to talk about this system just as an example of, of, of automation. Um, we've talked about very capital intensive type automations that, that you can implement inside of, um, inside of supply chain process. Um, in this case, we're talking about um, a system that is essentially entirely OPEX from the perspective of the customer because we're, our business model is to rent the, the service and the system as a software as a service uh, model. So there's no upfront cost to purchase drones or install anything in the warehouse itself. And, and you can immediately start receiving benefits from the automation of your cycle counting uh, process. Um, so we're talking about increasing the efficiency, uh, quality of your stock check, um, as well as the speed that it's performed at, since drones can fly approximately 400 locations per hour compared to a human that can do less than half of that. Um, and then lower cost because you're not using a team of humans to perform this check. Um, and in fact, with this system, because we're collecting uh, pictorial information about every uh, warehouse location, and because we're doing this across the supply chain, um, what we found is we're able to provide recommendations on the placement of items. A lot of warehouses follow the ABC model of items less frequently uh, picked, uh, the C type items being placed in the back. But these types of um, allocations tend to not be exploiting the real time data that could further optimize and potentially increase warehouse utilization rates. Um, and so this is all uh, a foundational um, technology that's, that's predicated on having the terabytes of data that we've accumulated through our operations. Um, so you have to perform these stock checks inside of the warehouses. Um, as I've said, stock checking can be dangerous. There's a need to avoid um, COVID um, and accumulate lots of people inside of a warehouse, which can potentially spread that. We're seeing a lot of customers trying to avoid these super spreader events where um, the annual stock take involves you know, every person at the office coming down to help with the stock check. It's really not a great, um, great thing to be doing to your employees. And so uh, we're really seeing a lot of opportunity here with, uh, with this kind of um, low capital intensity automation at the far right side of the long tail. So even if your warehouse doesn't have that high velocity, um, this system could potentially give you that edge increase your efficiency and lower your cost. And what we're seeing here, sorry, this is in um, a mix of Thai baht and US dollars here, but we are, yeah, almost everything here is in US dollars. And what we're talking about here is a, 
uh, really a, a very large market opportunity here for this kind of automation to save um, warehouse uh, customers over 10 billion US dollars per year. All right, I'll say thank you and potentially Megla, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. I'm just going to remove your slides from the screen. And um, yeah, very interesting, very fascinating. It really looks like something out of a Star Wars movie when you see all of those drones flying around uh, the warehouse. Very fascinating. So guys, let us know if you have any questions for uh, Michael and um, uh, he will address those questions. So Michael, why did you specifically choose Thailand to be based in? I mean, is there a strategic reason for choosing Thailand as your base or is it just because you like the beaches there? <laughs> well, the beaches are nice. Um, but to be honest, the, the opportunity here um, in terms of um, Thailand being a center of commerce, uh, there is a deep water port at Lam Chabang and um, several centers of logistics in Bangkok which uh, really make this a, a very large, probably the third or fourth largest um, uh, center for logistics in Southeast Asia. So I think uh, it's a kind of a relative trade-off between the uh, commercial opportunity and the uh, uh, competitive intensity, let's say. So here, here in Thailand, we, we have the field relatively uh, to ourselves at the moment, um, but we're also, um, looking at deployments in a variety of countries around the region here, including in Indonesia, uh, in Malaysia, Singapore, um, and also uh, in, uh, in Europe, we're active now in uh, warehouses in uh, Germany. So I think the, the great thing about a software as a service, uh, and we're seeing now in the, in the teeth of this uh, COVID crisis, I think it's possible to run a business virtually anywhere and um, deliver value for customers uh, around the world. Absolutely. Christine has a question for you, Michael. Do you have a list of 3PLs that use your services for your software? Uh, we, well, I, I certainly do. Uh, I'm unfortunately unable to share the incomplete list, but um, I think you saw in that video there, one of our uh, great partners um, is uh, Siva, who have um, been able to deploy our system. And so I'm comfortable to... Uh, discuss their name and talk about it like that. But we definitely have a, have a list of 3PLs. They tend to be the perfect customer for the system because um, they have a high visibility on their stock check because they have customers themselves that they want to um, really have a very high accuracy of a stock check to present to. Um, so with the pictures, they have this great audit evidence that they can present to customers um, and say, you know, this is definitely what's in the warehouse. These are your products. And uh, th they really like the system. Fantastic. Well, Michael, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing this information. And guys watching, if you want more information about Fling, head over to fling.asia and um, um, learn more about all the fascinating drones in warehousing. Thank you so much, Michael, uh, for joining us. And we'll see you around. Take care. Thank bye -bye. you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, so I'm going to invite Karen back on stage now. Welcome back, Hi. Karen. That was cool. That Hi. was high tech logistics. <laughs> I know. Wasn't that cool? I just love those drones whizzing around the warehouse and yeah, super impressive. Yeah, and, and it's so true that you can just do business virtually anywhere now. So this business can really help out. Exactly. I mean, just imagine people have not been traveling to China for, you know, almost three years, right? I mean, it was yeah. unimaginable previously, but, you know, business has been happening. So, yeah. Yep. All right. So let's get started with our first supplier. Who's our first supplier, okay. Karen? Uh, we have Mai from MyT. Um, actually, we have three uh, suppliers coming up. First of all is Mai from MyT, and she does eco-friendly baskets from Vietnam. Hi, Mai. I just unmuted. Uh, you muted yourself, so you have to unmute yourself. Uh, hi, everyone. Okay, hi. Can you hear Hello. me? Hello. Uh, yes. So, thank you for having me. Yes. Um, so uh, actually, I had a quick glance at, at her product the other day. So can you just give a like one minute quick, quick introduction about your company and then three to four minutes about your product? Tell the world about how good your products are. 
Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mai, and I'm sales manager at our MIT company. Uh, our company is located in Hanoi, Vietnam, and uh, we are manufacturer of uh, uh, handcrafted products. Um, our, all of our products uh, is handcrafted by Vietnamese uh, skillful artisans, um, and. Um, we have a variety of products, as you can see uh, in my so in our showrooms. Uh, we have a, a fashion bags, uh, we have baskets, uh, we have accessories, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, seasonal items. Uh, what makes us different from us companies is the uh, unique materials we use to create our products. Uh, the materials we use uh, to create our products uh, is called uh, paper pen or paper thread. Uh, paper thread uh, is made by recycling uh, paper waste, uh, such as a paper bag and a milk cartons. Um, because of uh, uh, its uh, strength and durability, uh, several decades ago, paper pens were used as uh, packing materials and uh, uh, obviously, uh, paper band is uh, sustainable materials, uh, so our products are uh, eco-friendly items. Uh, today, uh, we have two products um, to introduce to you. The first one is a uh, shopping bag, uh, as you can see it in my hands. Um, this big size of uh, bags can use as shopping bags, as also beach bags. Um, now, and of course, uh, this bag Sorry, is uh, Mike, one. Can you yes. move your camera down ah. a bit because the bag is not clear? So put your camera oh. down a bit. Or yeah, yeah, put okay, the bag, okay, okay. put the camera down okay. a bit so that we can okay. see the bag clearly. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. And of course, this uh, bag is 100% uh, handmade, handcrafted uh, by uh, our uh, workers. Um, this uh, we can also can text the brand uh, name and logo of customers uh, on the back uh, if uh, the customer uh, requests. Um, the second item uh, I want to introduce to you is very small items. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, this one, uh, as you can that see. That is so cute. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's very uh, little items. It can be used as a key chain. Um, also, uh, if you hang it on the Christmas trees, uh, it can be used as Christmas uh, ornament. Um, also, if uh, a lot of our customers uh, buy this item, uh, they put uh, this item in a, a box like this, uh, and it uh, can become a gift to their friends. And we have a variety of uh, these small items, like uh, this one, or this one. Uh, yeah, and uh, um, on a, uh, this um, a kitchen, uh, they uh, shape as a uh, bag or basket, and it can be used at a multi-purpose items. Uh, so uh, it's my presentation. Uh, thank you for watching. OK, those are so cute. That would be so cool if we have like a, a whole set of those hanging on our tr a Christmas tree or even as decoration at home. Yeah, and once again, there was a really nice purple there. Megha, did you see that? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Um, for um, if there is any question from my, feel free to type it in, or you can always contact her at www.globalsources.com slash mytcraft.co. Yeah, she'll be happy to answer any questions there. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Have Bye. a nice day. Thank okay, you. See you next time. Bye. Okay. So, so um, cute. Those little baskets are so cute. <laughs> yes, I saw that too. Um, last time she showed us that it was like a Christmas, like an exactly a Christmas ornament, but I guess she picked a different mm -hmm. one this time, which is even cuter. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we are supposed to have our next um, supplier here. Uh, Intercontinental marketing yes yes so we have so we have sunny from intercontinental hi sunny are you there hi 
Oh, hi. Hi, how are you? Hi, Good. How are you? Great. Okay. Um, we, um, we prepare presentations. So can I uh, share my screen to, to you? Yes, sure. Um, okay. This one? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, we are IMS um, that we located in Taiwan, Taipei. And that we are um, very professional and uh, um, mainly um, kitchenware, houseware products for nearly uh, 30 years. We have own factories and office and our headquarters is in Taipei. We also have divisions in uh, China and we export um, kitchenware products, houseware products worldwide. And uh, we export for um, gadgets, backing tools, backwares, uh, cooking tools, utensils, and uh, barwares, um, barbecue tools. And uh, today we are presenting you the best sellers for last year uh, is about the silicon products. This is um, silicon food storage bag. It's um, reusable and it's um, also- Sunny, are you changing your slides? Cause we can't, uh, we're just seeing one slide. Oh. Um, I think you need to change the slide and uh, yeah. Okay, just a minute. Now we can see us on slide seven. Seven? Okay. Yeah. 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 Have you seen this um, before? The no. Best? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, okay. So let me back to this slide. Uh, this is our best seller last year, and it's a reusable silicon food storage bag. And is um, very useful, and it go to um, fridge bag as well, and it can stand up, and the leak proof. We have uh, many, many size and customized on this product. Yeah, how to go with the next one? This one. So you can just click on the sixth slide on the left. Yeah, now we can see slide yes. six. Yeah. Okay, great. So here are some um, demonstration photos. So here you can put in the liquid and it can seal very well. And this is upright over side for the back. And the next one is also um, very um, pro promising product is a steamer like this. You can put it in the wok and the steam net and the easy to clean and uh, easy to organize. And the next one is a trivet for dish, for like a hot pot. And the next one is for, for eggs egg mode and we yeah. can also customize for uh, the patterns customer will uh, designs they look very cute yes <laughs> yes um okay. and the i think it's uh, very easy to see in the market is um can for uh, multiple um functions for chocolate, for uh, cookies, or for um, cakes, small cakes. We have a question from Raj. Yeah. He's asking, are these products FDA certified? Yes, FDA certified. Because we also um, export to America and Europe. Europe. So um, these have to go with um, like a VOC test, and food product safe test, so FDA, of course. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then I go to the next slide, and this is a tea bag. 
and um, buyer can design their um, their own patterns as well. Uh, here, because we are um, also produce a, a lot of kitchen wares, so um, here is uh, silicon go with um, stainless steel and mega tools. And go with the barbecue and this uh, Bristol, silicon Bristol is much safer than um, natural um, Bristol because it will not burn the, uh, the hair and uh, w um, people won't eat the hair from the Bristol. So silicon is much safer than uh, natural Bristol's. And this is the fish turner. Um, for this silicon age, it's also uh, easily to uh, turn off the uh, meat, fish, and uh, also um, uh, not uh, scratch from your uh, non-coating non -coating pants. And this uh, is a spatula. We can print and produce some um, patterns for brands or customize um, um, hashtag some names on it. And this is go with the wood, wood handle. Uh, the last one, um, this is a silicon gloves. Uh, it's, we can also produce a longer one. So you can wear the gloves and uh, go um, directly to the hot water to, um, to, uh, to cook. And this is a turkey bastard. Uh, we have more products, but these products we present today is uh, the best seller in 2021. Yeah, and uh, we have more other um, material uh, products. So uh, if you are interested, you can also visit our um, website. Yes, yes that, those are very nice. Um, um, any further questions for Sunny? Or feel free to contact her at globalsources.com, imsfe.co. Yeah, I, I have something similar like that at home. I just want to get more now. And th that one, that spatula with printing on it is very cute. Yes. Okay. Um. Yeah. Thank you, Sunny. And see you next time. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. See you next thank time. Thank you. See you. Okay. So next, uh, we have Sabi from India. Hi, Sabi. Can you hear us? Seems like their mic is not working. Hello, Sabi. Can't hear oh, you. Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> we can't hear you. Uh, just go into the settings at the bottom of your screen and make sure that the correct mic is selected. Just click on the gear icon at the bottom in settings and uh, go into audio. Make sure that the correct mic is selected. Sorry, guys. Tech issues. <laughs> yeah, it always happens. <laughs> yeah, something or the other has to happen, right? <laughs> yeah. It won't be a live uh, <laughs> conference. OK, I think we're picking up their voice. Hi, Sabi, can you hear us? Okay, I think he can again. hear us, but but we can't we can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, we can't hear you. Okay, Sabi, why yeah. don't you try to fix your uh, audio um, and then we'll come back to you in about 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay? okay? Okay, we'll see you in 30 minutes. Okay. So let's move on to our next presentation now. And we've got Carla waiting backstage. Yes. So I'm just going to add... Carla on this stage and the screen Hi, Carla. here. Hi, Karen. Hi, Carla. How are you? Good, you? <laughs> Good. Great, great. Awesome. So, Carla, um, you're going to be talking about how to build uh, an e commerce brand and the secrets to building a brand starter kit to scaling your e commerce business. A super exciting topic over there. Um, do you want me to share your slides? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So just give me a second here. 
Let me just make sure I have the correct slides. Okay. They're just loading. Great. So Carla, where are you joining us from? Yes. Yes, I'm joining you from, from London. I'm based in London. The company okay. has uh, different offices. Uh, Berlin is the biggest one. Then we have an office in London, Miami, Shenzhen. So yeah, I'm based here. Awesome. All right, I've got your slides here. So Great. let's get started. And uh, you can just let me know when you want to uh, change or go to the next slide. Super. Just to understand a bit on the timing, do I have 30 minutes, 45 minutes? How much time would I have? Yes, yeah, so you have about 25 minutes for the presentation, and then we'll maybe have like five minutes for Q&A towards the end. Super. Thank you so much. Great. So thanks, everyone. Uh, if you want, we can move to the next uh, slide, Megla. Thank you. So I'm Carla, Senior Strategic Integration Manager at CellarX. Uh, CellarX is an Amazon aggregator. And as I was saying to Megla before, it's based in Berlin. So we're looking for companies that we can acquire and, and grow in the further years uh, to become one of the biggest uh, aggregators. And, and in the end, consumer good companies uh, focus on e-commerce uh, in the world. So my background is in consulting and in law. I was a lawyer and then moved into consulting where I learned that uh, e-commerce and, and consumer goods was uh, my passion. And I was also... Uh, doing an MBA at INSEAD, so partly based in Singapore, where I believe most of our, our speakers are based on uh, today. And um, my passion resides on really growing businesses, uh, traveling in emerging markets, uh, and volunteering. So, Megla, if you want to move to the following slide, please. Thank you so much. So, what do we do to improve or actually grow or build our businesses? And here I would talk Sorry, about. Sorry, Carla, I just, I just want to. Uh... Correct. So you have 45 minutes, not 30 minutes <laughs> because you're a sponsor. You get more time. So Karen just reminded me you have 45 minutes. So take your time. <laughs> Great. I won't rush it then. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. All right. Super. So what do we do to, to improve or, or to build our businesses here? So here we're focusing on five main levers. The two of them, uh, the two first of them, so operational efficiency and brand development are more regarding the fact of what can we do with the current business that we have. So we're talking about the current agents or products that we're having in the marketplace where we're operating and in the geographies where we're operating. So what, how can we make the most out of that? And the three other parts would be regional expansion, channel expansion or product expansion. So expanding to other regions, if you're based in the US, going into Europe or vice versa, channel expansion, if you're mostly selling through Amazon, going to other marketplaces like Shopify, eBay, Walmart, and product expansion, either launching product variations or launching a uh, new products. So that's a bit how we're seeing, how are we building the companies that we're actually acquiring? And those are the levers that we are uh, acting upon once we acquire them. So moving into the next slide, we will show how are we looking at operational efficiency. So when we're thinking about operational efficiency, we're always thinking that whenever we acquire a brand, we're aiming to improve the efficiency of every each of every and each one of these brands by 30%. So what are the different things that we're looking at when we're talking about operational efficiency? The first part would be supply chain. And in supply chain, we're obsessed with two parts, out of stock and IPI. I believe in most of the sellers, out of stock is one of the most important parts that they're looking at uh, almost daily or weekly. So this is extremely important uh, and it's the basis not to, to really grow the brand and to be able to, to perform well. So obsessed on not being out of stock is super, super, super important. And with this, we have been different uh, movements or, or, or different changes on Amazon. And what is the FBA uh, limit that we have there in the in inventory? So what we're looking at is also to increase coverage in 3PLs and even moving into FBM sometimes or a combination between FBA and FBM to make sure that we are prepared whenever these uh, limits make arise uh, again in the future. Another part that we're looking at in supply chain is a uh, IPI, so inventory performance index score. Here, uh, there's different uh, sub uh, parts that conform the total IPI score. And the main focus here that we're looking at is the sell through rate. So the sell through rate is extremely important because it's one of the ones that affect more uh, the IPI score because, and also because it's one that we can actually control uh, quite well. So making sure that you don't have 
long tail agents that are there not selling or just selling a few units every month and that actually can affect your IPA score. And therefore in the future, maybe your inventory limits too. The second part that we're looking at is content. So how can we get a perfect data quality score? So here there's different things that we can be doing at. The first one, for example, would be to have more than five pictures. And not only the number of pictures is important, but also what are you showing in each one of them? So for example, making sure that you're complying with the Amazon requirements. The first picture has to be with a white background, not a fake picture, but actually a real picture of the, of the product, not, not made by a computer. The second picture showing what are the functionalities. The third picture showing how is the product used in the environment. So for example, if we're talking about a baby blanket, uh, having a baby playing with a blanket. Um, so really making sure that you have uh, enough pictures, but also that you're compliant with the Amazon policies there. The second part that we're actually doing, and this is something that most of, or many of the sellers that we have acquired do not have when we acquire them, was uh, having a video. So actually the video shows a very realistic uh, point of, like image of, of your product. And it's really, really useful to have this. The third part would be to have A plus content. So make sure that you have um, the great pictures, the great videos, but also that you have the right uh, keywords, uh, the right title, uh, right bullet points, and making sure that that works uh, really well. And then check the result on the cell phone. It seems uh, quite obvious to check the result on the uh, cell phone, but more and more sales are being generated or actually acquired the products from the cell phone instead of the computer. So we really, really recommend that you actually check how are the images and how is the content uh, seen from the cell phone as more and more sellers uh, or customers are going to come from, from cell phone purchases. The third part that we're looking at is the marketing. And marketing goes very much uh, together with the pricing as you will play together uh, both of these parts. So when we're talking about marketing, we're talking about CEO. So what are your keywords? And, and check these keywords on a regular basis. Make sure that you don't have any negative keywords there and that you're actually eliminating this. And, and the, the ones that you're having and that you're uh, bidding to are, are really the right ones. And make sure that you're looking at that so, so that you are changing them or adapting with the market if new trends uh, arise. And the second part would be to adapt your PPC campaign to your marketing strategy. So here, this is very much aligned with the price. In the end, you have to have a strategy you know, when you're having a product in, in, in your marketplace. And the strategy could be either you're entering the market or you're, or you're already in the market and have either a defensive or an offensive position. A defensive when you have someone else that is entering the market, for example, or an offend, and, and you're actually defending your price point, or an offensive when you actually want to acquire more market share of the market and you actually want to push further uh, to be, have more presence in this marketplace. So depending on this, you will play with pricing and with PPC. Regarding pricing, again, you have to take into consideration what is your strategy in this market, and then taking that into consideration, test your price and be reactive to how the competition, uh, how the competition uh, moves, depending on how you're testing your price. And always have this as a movement uh, for, for, for a long period of time. I mean, we always have to be looking at pricing and, and, and PPC um, spend or, or the marketing initiatives. It's not something that you just do and let it uh, work for months. You really, really need to be there looking at uh, what you're doing. And on pricing also, be conscious about what is, your strategy can change, no? depending on how your competition or how your environment is moving. So for example, if a competitor gets out of stock, make sure you take that opportunity and you actually test your price and potentially increase your price at that time, as you will be one of the main leaders in the market. And regarding pricing also, always try to plan a deal strategy for the year. So we recommend to look at what are your deals, your coupons, another marketing strategy, and then see the reactivity of your agents to the deals, as we were saying before, test your price, but also test your deals, and also be flexible to adapting in case they're not working. Also, we normally plan for one year, but I would say that every three months we're reviewing the strategy in the sense that the market moves so fast that you need to be up to date and actually making sure that what you plant is the right thing to do. And also when you're planning at the strategy, make sure what are the most important days uh, during the year, or if there are any special events that are important for you. So for example, if we were talking about um, health supplements, potentially just after Christmas is a great uh, opportunity because in January, everyone wants to get be healthy and, and make sure that they're getting back on track on their health. So, so make sure that you're looking at, at the right day or maybe Valentine's Day for another type of product. 
Then process. Process is extremely, extremely important. So you have all of these little things that we were talking about before, supply chain, content, marketing, price, but you need to make sure that you're actually setting up the right checks that can be weekly, daily, monthly, depending on the checks, and making sure that you're looking at this uh, constantly. So set up your processes that work well for you. So as weekly or daily checks, we would look at account health, make sure that you don't, you're don't, you not under verification or Amazon is not requiring any additional uh, documentation or, or, or information, which could actually block your account, which would be the worst uh, situation you could be at. Look at your listing quality. Look at your customer reviews. If you have any negative uh, feedback, you have two weeks to go by, look at it, maybe remove uh, that negative uh, feedback. So really set up your processes to make sure that you have your all your checks put in place uh, for the previous uh, parts that we were talking about. And the last part is benefit from Amazon programs. We actually have a small and light, Pan EU, B2B, FBA export, all of this, and, and, and each company has to make a tailor-made decision for which of them apply to them. But we actually acquired a brand that was not using small and light when they could actually use it. And of course, Amazon fees are, are much lower and we get a huge optimization there. So make sure that you actually look at all of these uh, Amazon programs that they're offering to you and to take advantage of them if they're applicable uh, to you. So that would be about operational efficiency. If we move to the next slide, we will talk about brand development. So when we're talking about here's how do we build our brand and, and what is the message that we want to give with our product and how are we going to actually engage our customers with this product to actually maybe have additional sales in the future. So when we're thinking about the brand development, we're thinking about a story of the product. So how is the product moving uh, across the customer and how is the customer experiencing our product since the beginning till the end? So a bit of the customer uh, life, the product lifetime with the customer. So here we're talking about what are all the touch points that the customer has with our product. And of course, the first one would be reach, where they actually see our product. And here we have different uh, ways that we can reach our, our customers. We can have our own websites in Shopify, for example, in which we are actually showing our brand, showing our story. We have all the space for us not to really, really show what are we, what is the message that we want to give um, with the product. We can be in marketplaces, B2C or B2B. Here, the, the, the position is completely dis different as you're competing with other products and, and mostly they will be just placed next to you. So here you want to think about what is the positioning and what is the message that what I want to show when I'm in a marketplace and how do I differentiate versus my main competitors. So this one would be the first one. How are you reaching uh, your customers and what do you want to show them depending on the, the different uh, places where you're actually uh, showing your product to them. The second part would be trust. So you really need to define a clear and coherent um, price and value proposition. So here we will talk about low and high price and premium and basic um, value proposition. So you want to make sure that you're either in the high premium or in the low basic, but we want to be careful not to be in the low premium or high basic as this will not be as coherent uh, to the market. So make sure that you understand where do you want to position yourself? Do you want to be more towards the premium high products or do you want to play in price and have more of a low quality or basic quality uh, type of product, not low basic. The third part would be content and the content has to be coherent with this uh, trust that we were talking before. So on the content, as we were talking about before, and also should make sure that you're showing the right uh, pictures on Amazon, especially. So first one with a white background, second one showing how you're using the product, third one uh, showing it on, 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 on a context, on an environment. And this really helps the customer understand what type of product am I acquiring and what type of quality of the product am I acquiring and what are the uses that my product can have? Or maybe like, how do I have to maintain uh, this product? So here, make sure that this is coherent with your premium or basic quality. You want to make sure that the customer sees that through your content. The first part would be the unboxing. So the unboxing strategy would be, how is the customer receiving your product once they actually acquire it? And here, we would, I would like to explain you um, a story that we actually had with one of the brands that we acquired. So this brand had uh, many different products that they were selling of different sizes. And one of the, the projects that we did with the brand was the fact of having one unboxing, one box, uh, one packaging for all the different products instead of having different types of boxes for all the different products. So here it's a combination between what do we want to show to the customer and how do we want to position to the customer 
versus also how what is the investment that I'm doing, no? And here you can have a, a premium uh, positioning while trying to have a lower investment instead of having three types of boxes or five types of boxes to the different products, having one box that adapts to all of these products. And this is actually what we did here and optimization was great. So after you have this unboxing and content that are coherent with the product proposition that you have, so the trust, usage is extremely, extremely, extremely important. So actually when the product is used by your customer, how is the customer perceiving it? Is it coherent with the value proposition that you were showing at the beginning? Do they trust what they said, what they actually acquired? Is it what they wanted, what they expected from the pictures, the content that you actually uh, developed and, and showed them? So this is extremely, extremely important. Reviews, ratings are, are one of the most important parts to position yourself well in a marketplace. And the last part would be engagement and customer service. So this is how are you actually going to interact with your community. And we have many different examples. We have one paint uh, company that actually had a huge uh, Facebook uh, community that uh, worked greatly. And that was a way to engage with the customers, explain how they're using their products, explain how they can combine different products or what are the main uses uh, to your products or actually answer questions from the customers when they were using the products. So this is great. Like really trying to build your community also contributes to building your brand and actually to having this customer engagement from the brand. And customer service is very much related to this. So instead of building a community, making sure that you're actually there for your customer to reach out whenever they have a question or a comment on your product. And regarding engagement and customer service and also the usage, be very open to listening to what your customer wants to tell you in the sense that also for product development or product improvement, you can actually improve uh, your products by comments that you're receiving from your customers. And this would be beneficial for you as well in the future by launching this better product or best product uh, in the market, as well as product launching. So I will explain a story later on of a product launching, but actually listening to your customers is a great way to know what other products could we launch that are similar to ours that are fitting the market or that there is a need in the market. So really, really important, listen to your customer. Moving on to the expansion part. If we could, great, thank you so much. So regarding the expansion, there are three types of expansion, regional expansion, channel expansion, and product expansion. The difference here is huge, huge in complexity and, and, and really on having a tailor-made approach to your brand. So normally we always go through regional expansion or geographic expansion. That's something that we are always looking at because we really want to have brands that are selling throughout uh, the globe and not only in Europe or not only in the US, which are the main markets that uh, the brands that we are acquiring are, are selling on. But then channel expansion is something that we're really looking at, but it's a bit more complex. And then product expansion uh, in the case of new product launch is also quite complex. So Really, the, the, the decision you have to make here is quite tailor-made, depending on your resources, what type of brand do you want to have, where do you want to position this brand, um, of what are you going to do here. But I would say that overall, regional expansion is easier than channel expansion and product expansion. And therefore, that's why we always go through that. And, and, and yeah, that's what uh, we're, we're currently doing at. So regarding regional expansion, here we have two types of expansion. We would have continental or intra-region expansion, and we had intercontinental expansion. The first one, continental expansion, for example, would be if you're just selling in Germany, making sure that you're also selling in Pan EU or in the UK. So looking at your continent, where can you actually sell? Of course, Pan EU, so for example, selling from Germany and actually expanding to also Spain, France, Italy, and the rest of uh, Pan EU countries, it's much, much easier as you can actually have one Amazon um, center that is distributing for all the all the pan EU region whilst setting up in the uk would be a bit more complex but still easier than actually going to intercontinental expansion so going uh, to to the us for example and the same would happen if you're based in the us it's far, far easier to uh, go to canada or, or mexico than actually maybe to go to europe so regarding continental or inter-region expansion we would talk about um remote fulfillment. So inbounding one country to fulfill the region, that would be the Pan-EU uh, continental or inter-regional expansion. So here it would be three months to prepare because in the end you want to make sure that you have the stock available to sell in all of these uh, countries that we're talking about and the listings. So for example, the listings would refer to 
the fact that you're selling in Germany, so you have your German listings with your German keywords. You want to make sure that you have actually the Spanish listings, the French listings, the Italian listings with each one of the keywords for these specific countries. Make sure you're not actually translating your German keywords because keywords don't work with translation. So each one of the different marketplaces will need a, a search on the keywords of what are the relevant keywords for your product in that country, in that language. So make sure that you're doing that uh, work yourself or, or being helped by others. And once you have these listings prepared and the stock available to sell, then you would um, open up uh, in these new other countries. Intercontinental expansion, on the hand, will, have, will take more time, six to nine months to prepare. Why is this? Uh, because we really need to maybe create a legal entity or other legal documentation, create bank accounts uh, or open bank accounts you will need to have uh, credit cards on those uh, bank accounts in the new countries, tax um, tax documentation like VAT, EINs. So this really, really, really takes uh, far more time. So we will talk about six to nine months to prepare. Also having the stock and the listings prepared there uh, would be uh, necessary. But of course, this will take a shorter term than, than these legal tax documents that we're talking about. And no matter what regional expansion you're doing, continental or intercontinental expansion, you will always need six months to reach full potential, to really ramp up and, and grow in, in that country and, and reach your full potential in that country. So one other things that we need to take, we're, we're taking into consideration when we're talking about regional expansion, we're looking at review transferability. So this is extremely, extremely, extremely important. When, and in continental, it will be automatic. So for example, if you're in uh, Germany and you want to expand to the rest of uh, Fritz, so France, uh, Italy, and, and Spain, that would be automatically, you will have this review transferability from the German uh, situation to the rest of the countries. Or in an intercontinental, you actually need to link the account. So if you're in Germany and you want to expand to the US, you have to link uh, both accounts. And then you have the, the local reviews. Why is this so important? because you're super well positioned in Germany and that's why you want to grow into other countries. And this great positioning that you have in Germany will be there in the other countries, the, the review transferability will be there for a specific period of time, but not indefinitely. The period of time will depend on how fast you're selling and how many reviews you're getting. So if you're selling super fast and getting a lot of reviews, very fast you're going to lose the German ones. But at the same time, it's great because you're actually selling a lot and having these reviews. If you're sell, if you're sell, um, time is lower and you're actually selling uh, less or, or you're taking them with more time and you're getting less reviews, they will be there for a bit uh, longer, not much, but a bit longer. Why is this extremely important? Because you have a privileged position when you're actually launching to these uh, new market, new regions for a specific period of time. So you really want to have your pricing, your campaigns really, really well put in place to make sure that you're getting the most out of it, of this specific period that you'll get Position yourself super well at the beginning and just maintain that position in the future for this new uh, region that you just expanded. So really make sure that you have the rate PPC, review campaigns, pricing uh, in place when you're actually just launching into this, uh, in these new geographies. The second part that we're really looking at is a trademark risk infringement. So this is in super important. Trademark, trademark law is very different in Europe than in the US. And sometimes you may have a product that is protected in the US, but will not be protected in Europe or vice versa. So here, what we recommend, and would only happen in inter intercontinental expansion. So here, what we really recommend is that you ex estimate the potential attack risk versus winning the case. And potentially, if you would not be protected in the new, um, in the new region that you're going, potentially rebrand or decide not to expand because the risk can be extremely high and you can have actually a dedication of resources to grow into that marketplace and, and just get uh, not allowed to sell in, in the future. So really make sure that you're looking at this trademark risk infringement. And if you're at risk, either rebrand or decide not to expand potentially. So that would be about regional expansion. Another thing that we're actually doing at whenever we're acquiring brands is channel expansion. So mostly we buy companies that are based on Amazon and FBA. But of course, we want to be present in other marketplaces like Walmart, eBay, Bold.com, Allegro, Shopify. So how do, this, how do we decide to do channel expansion? Here, it's an extremely tailored made decision based on the potential of the brand in the marketplace. And each brand has a different potential in each one of the marketplaces. Not only is it about the potential of the brand in the marketplace, but we also take into consideration other, other, other points when we're deciding what 
or marketplaces are the right ones for this brand that we actually acquired. The first part would be the fit of the product with the brand. So what we're talking about here um, is that really the, the product or, or, or the brand that we are acquiring fits with the marketplace. So for example, Etsy. Etsy is a marketplace that is really about tailored made, handmade products. Um, and we only want to launch there really this tailor made or handmade uh, type of products that we're actually acquiring. So if it's just um, a basic um, a basic product, so think about a, a tool to work on the garden that is a, that doesn't have anything special. It's just like a basic good uh, tool uh, to work on the uh, garden. We will not think about an Etsy to, to expand there. But on the other hand, if we're buying more of a tailor, like handmade uh, product, that I don't know, like a basket in the house that is handmade, then we will think about an Etsy to, to, sell in that, uh, to sell in that marketplace. The second part is extremely important as well. So it's the size of the marketplace and the category within the marketplace. So you want to make sure that the marketplace is big enough for you to make an investment to actually grow in that marketplace. So what we're looking here is that the category within the marketplace that you're looking at is big enough for you. So make sure that you try to understand how many competitors are there, what are their approximate sales, and try to get those numbers going so you understand what is the potential for me and is the investment that I'm going to do to enter that marketplace uh, makes sense or, or, or doesn't. The third part would be competition in the marketplace. So competition varies hugely about, uh, among marketplaces. We would say that Amazon is one of the biggest uh, marketplaces or the biggest marketplace. And, and there we really have a huge uh, competition normally, no? But in other smaller marketplaces, maybe competition dynamics are completely different. And normally it can be that there's less competition, but it could also happen that, um, for example, handmade in Etsy, you could have more competition because other sem similar sellers actually are selling there. So make sure that you're selling the competition in the marketplace and also what is the positioning in that marketplace. So look at the pricing positioning. Is it Could you actually enter with your prices to that marketplace with, that comp with those competitors? The other point that we're looking at is easiness to expand across geographies. This is extremely, extremely important, and it's also re related to the size of the marketplace or category. So when you're looking at that, you can look at the specific geography that you want to go into, but you should also look at what is my full potential if I want to go into that marketplace. And here, when we're talking about uh, easiness across uh, to expand across geographies, is how many other geographies would I have within the same marketplace and how easy it is to expand to these other geographies? What are the requirements that they're asking me to have? Extremely, extremely important. The fourth important part would be payment complexity. So for example, if you want to operate in eBay, you will have to have a PayPal account. And maybe for other marketplaces, you will need to have other banking uh, accounts or, or, or online banking accounts that they would need. So make sure that you're willing to do that and that that's not a problem for you. And um, make sure that you have this uh, payments complexity into your equation when you're deciding to which uh, other channels to expand. And the last but not least, this is extremely, extremely, extremely important as it will help you uh, open to the new, market, uh, new, new, new marketplaces in an easier ways. What is the supply chain complexity? Especially if you're in Amazon FBA, all the supply chain complexity is quite transferred into Amazon. So make sure that you're actually going into other marketplaces that are not extremely um, difficult regarding supply chain or that you're willing to actually do that effort and do that change. So when we're talking about supply chain complexity, the way that we are actually analyzing this when we're looking at our brands is that the first priority would be to go to own fulfillment uh, systems kind of uh, market, uh, marketplaces. So that would be, for example, Walmart or Bold.com offer this fulfillment system or places where it's extremely easy to launch. So, for example, Kofland or Otto, we're talking about the e and eBay, sorry. The second priority that we're looking at is what are new marketplaces where Amazon is not as strong as the market leader. So for example, Allegro or Emac are much bigger in their countries than Amazon. So those are extremely interesting if you're interested in opening in that uh, geographies. Or maybe not as relevant. So for example, in, Fr in France, C-discount is far more known and, and, and relevant, either, even if Amazon is really catching up here, than, than, than Amazon. So maybe C-discount could be a really interesting marketplace if we want to expand to France. And the third priority here will be talking about other marketplaces. So, for example, if you're looking at a global mobile uh, type of, mar uh, of, of marketplace, then Wish would be a, a great marketplace here. And another marketplace we're looking at is depending on like the countries. So maybe if you want to go to South Korea, you have a specific marketplace that would be um, interesting for you because your product has a great fit in South Korea. So make sure that you're actually also looking at that. 
And the last part would be, especially if you're looking at expanding to more than two marketplaces, make sure that you have all the information easy for you. So for example, Channel Engine is a multi-channel listing tool that we're actually looking at implementing at SellerX that will help us understand to get the full picture, both on Amazon and the other marketplaces that we're operating, what are the revenues, what are the margins, what is the stock situation, to really get a good grasp without having to invest a ton of time on looking at each one of the different marketplaces. So really try to have that information in an easy way available for you to make sure that you're on top of your business. And the last part would be product expansion. So when we're talking about product expansion, complexity differs hugely amongst new product launches or variations. Variations are far easier than, than, than new product launches, as in the end, you already have the relationship with the supplier, you have the listing that you can use, and it's just about saying, okay, what does a customer could like here? So for example, if you're having uh, a dog leash, you could actually, and you have only one size and a black dog leash, you could actually have it on red and blue and on three sizes of dog leash. So that's much, much easier. You can work with a supplier that you already know, and you can actually use the listings that you actually have with it, with the reviews that you already have. In the other hand, you would have the new product launches. Here will be much tougher. So you have two to three months brainstorming and then six months checking the samples, ordering, making sure that compliance wise they're okay, uh, gathering the stock, preparing the listing. So here really we would need a far a bigger time of, of, of time dedication uh, in that case. And of course, six months again to, to reach full potential. And here there's quite an interesting story that we have with one of our brands. So this was a, a brand that is selling uh, supplements. And one of these supplements is uh, apple cider gummies. So apple cider gummies uh, are sold mostly for diets or actually weight loss. And one of the things that we did see is that a lot of comments that our clients was putting there is, is this product sugar-free? Because of course, thinking about dieting, some of the customers thought that it was sugar-free. We clarified that it was not sugar-free, but we also thought that there was a huge potential to maybe uh, launch sugar-free apple cider gummies. Of course, we were scared that they could cannibalize our apple cider gummies, but it was worth a try. So we actually launched sugar-free apple cider gummies, and it has been a, a great success uh, since then. And we're actually selling more or less, uh, a bit less than the apple cider gummies, but it reached a uh, really great sales there. So that was what I was telling you about before. Really pay attention to what your customers are asking for and what are they looking for, and maybe launch variations or new product launches depending on what you're hearing from them, as well as, of course, the, the new trends of the market that you should always be looking at. So, so great story there. And moving to the last uh, slide here. So what have we done with brands that we acquired? And I believe that it's helpful actually to see all of these little things that I was telling you about in two acquisitions that we actually had, had done. So the first acquisition, for example, was a European art supply brand. And the improvements that we have done up to date was a regional expansion. So for example, last 12 month sales share outside Germany, which was the country where they were selling, passed from 10% to 20%. And now I think this is even higher and we have just launched in the US. So we expect Germany to be a uh, far less than 50% um, at the end of this year or, 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 or next year. Instagram rate improved from 68 to 98% since closing. So we might want to make sure that we're not out of stock. So Instagram rate is extremely, extremely important. Our target is to be at 100% uh, as much as we can in Instagram rate. Listing optimization. So here we optimized 37 listings for PPC campaign SEO and content, and the conversion rate increased by 5 percentage points. I didn't talk much about conversion rate, but it's extremely important. And if you have a great conversion rate, you can always spend a bit less on marketing. So make sure that your conversion rate is, is great and that you are well um, positioned and well, that your content is the right content not to actually have a great conversion rate there. We launched 10 new products uh, since closing, which is extremely important for the art supply. Here, of course, depending on the category that you're at, um, launching products will be more or, or less important in the sense that, for example, art supplies, you really sell through product launches. You have to uh, launch different um, books so that children can color, and that's the way that you actually continue surviving in the market versus other ones that don't need as many product launches. So here was extremely, extremely important, and we launched 10 new products. And of course, as next steps, we're currently expanding into other channels, so B2B and other marketplaces, and focusing, as I was saying to you before, on the growth in the US. Another example that we have here is acquisition number six, is a US baby brand. And actually what we did is on regional expansion, started the EU certification process, and launched whole product range in the pan EU and UK. 
So this was a US uh, brand that we are actually launching in, in the EU. Instagrate improved from 80% to 100% since closing. We optimize all listings for BBC campaigns, SEO and content and increase conversion rate by 35%. Prepare the launch of three new product design variations that are going to be launched. And the next step is a new branding that is being finalized with content. And we really want to push in growth in Europe and in the channel expansion. So we're looking at B2B, building our own online shop, even an Etsy. So that's about um, the two examples that I was uh, showing you about. And maybe we can go to the next slide and I would be very happy to, to answer any questions that may, can, may have come around. That's awesome. That was just so much information and a lot of um, great strategies and tips for people who are looking to exit. So I'm just going to remove your slides. And um, yeah, everybody watching, let us know if you have any questions uh, from Car for Carla about um, all of what she shared. It was a lot to take in for sure. I mean, you crammed a lot into 45 minutes, but of course, everything is just super valuable and super useful. So I want to ask you, Carla, like, what are some of the common mistakes that you see sellers make as they are starting out, as they are starting to build their, uh, their, their brand? So... I would say that each seller is its own story, but it's true that one of the things that we're seeing at is that when you're starting, your, 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 the money that you can invest is limited. So it's true that you really need to do a great study of what is your product, where is the best fit for your product, and what's the best way to grow as fast as you can with limited resources. So of course, focus maybe on only one marketplace and focus only on one geography, really make it work make your product be great there and then expand into other areas. And, and there, of course, Focus a lot on content, which is just like making sure that uh, your content is right, your listing is right, your keywords are right. Negative keywords are super important. Make sure that you don't have them. And, and then make sure that you're not out of stock and, and that your IPI score is uh, great. So look a lot about like at account health. That's extremely important. And look how your inventory and, and your out of stock is looking at to make sure that you're not uh, getting out of stock. Because that is uh, quite common. And just like be on top of your business every single day, because I was saying, no, the, the, the dynamics of the market are moving uh, really all the time. So, so make sure that you have that. So if you have a competitor that is getting out of stock, try to increase your price. If you're going to go out of stock, stop marketing and then slightly increase your price as well to avoid getting out of stock. Just like be extremely reactive and, and really be on top of your business to make sure that um, you're on the right track. Nothing, nothing perfect exists, so yeah. <laughs> Christine is asking, what size company do you look to acquire in terms of number of products, number of sales per month, rankings, et cetera? Great. So the type of company that we're looking at um, is a company normally that is doing more than a million uh, in revenues uh, over the last uh, 12 months. Of course, we can be open to looking at companies that are uh, slightly smaller if they were growing uh, a lot, uh, but they really, really need to uh, prove that case. And, and of course, it would be very interesting to look at that. We're also looking at companies that have evergreen products. So what, by evergreen products, what we are referring to is products that have been selling for the past three years and will continue selling in the last three years. So it means no technology, no fast fashion. So it would it would mean, for example, a lot of these kitchen products or baby products or, or other type of evergreen products that, that we have. No, So those are the type of products that we're looking at. And then we're also looking at a margin. So around 30%, 20 to 30% CM3 is also something that we're looking at when I, where we are acquiring a, a brand. But we're looking at brands all over the world. Almost, uh, yeah, we've bought brands that were based in Australia, in Europe, in the US. We bought brands that are based in China, but are selling in other uh, marketplaces or, or other countries, sorry. So we're really open, open to that, uh, that type of businesses, yeah. Fantastic. And, mostly, and you also want, yeah, mm -hmm. go yeah, ahead. and mostly Amazon. That's also something that we're looking at. That their main marketplace is Amazon. Um, but yeah, we're we're currently expanding. But that's something that is great because we really can incorporate it very fast and start uh, start building the brand just as soon as we acquire it. Yeah, and also you don't want a brand that has already matured, right? I mean, you want a brand where that's there right. is a possibility and opportunity to grow it more. So I think that's super important as well. That's Carla, right. thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, no, we <laughs> actually delay. trying to buy for brands that we're, we're going to think that they're going to double the revenues in the next three years. So we don't want, for example, a brand like you were saying, you know, that is present in the US, in Europe, or that is already in like five different marketplaces. 
we're more looking at some brands that are focused in one geography or maybe two geographies, but they're looking at uh, only one marketplace or only one geography and in three marketplaces. So we really see this growth potential either through regional channel or product expansion. Which is the fastest growing category and country? That's a really hmm. good question. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so two categories that we're looking at that we're really lacking, or actually three categories that we're looking at that we're really lacking are baby products, pet products, and woman hygiene products. The three of them are growing quite a lot. Um, and we're really looking at companies that are on those spaces. But of course, uh, these are is our opinion. And maybe actually, if you look, uh, you may find other niches because it's full of niches that, that are interesting. No? So uh, really look at those. And, and for sure, you'll find some small, small, small niches that are also growing a lot. Regarding countries, I believe so I, I, I believe countries are, all of the countries are growing. Like e-commerce is still growing. We thought that, I mean, there's been a COVID bump, but it's still overall, if you look at the overall uh, trajectory, it's still growing overall in most countries. And of course, if you go to a place like, um, that is less developed in that marketplace, so I don't know, France, Italy, Spain, maybe they grow slightly faster, but just because they're smaller. Overall, doesn't mean that the revenues are going to be greater because a market like the US will be just huge. And we do see though that the US starts tendencies or starts um, trends before the U Europe. So you do see that some trends start in the US and then later on move to Europe, which is quite interesting as well. In, ma in many different categories, that's, that's the case. Right. Very interesting. So thank you so much, Carla, for joining us. And um, everybody uh, watching, you know, check out Seller X. And they also have a free um, business evaluation that they can do for your for your brand. So in case you're interested, in case you're already selling, go ahead to this link, bit.ly forward slash Seller X, fill in the form and uh, get your business evaluated. So thank you so much, uh, Carla, for joining us here. And uh, we'll see you around. Thank you, Mega. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. Bye. Okay, so let's move on to our supplier session now. And Karen, welcome back. Is uh, the Indian Hi. supplier ready now, Hansraj? Yes, let's see if Sabi is back. Hi, Sabir. Can you hear us? Hello. Audible? Hi. Yes, okay, good. It's working now. <laughs> Okay. Hi, hi Megha. Okay. This is Sid from Mansraj Majan and Sons. That is HRM. Uh, I'll just uh, give you a quick intro about the company and then Sabir here can introduce you uh, the items that we are showcasing today. Uh, basically, our company has the privilege of being the oldest uh, company that is manufacturing sports goods in India. We are an okay. ISO 9001-14001 certified company and we are amongst the top 10 exporters in the list of uh, the Ministry of Commerce in the Indian government. And uh, we are have the privilege also to be the official and exclusive suppliers to the Olympics way back uh, since the last 20 years. And uh, we are uh, supplying to some of the top brands and uh, chain stores in the world today. Uh, that is a quick intro about our company. Now, Sabir here will give you a technical uh, uh, display about the showcase that uh, we are we have put, put for you about our products. Sabir, take over, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello everyone. Today uh, our company is uh, basically in sports category and we have a wide range of products. Today we are uh, presenting our recycle uh, items uh, like uh, football, rugby ball and wooden items. We uh, manufacture recycle items and we are only the company in India who is doing this uh, business. I have one more person uh, I want to introduce Mr. Rajan who is a technical person uh, in this category. Hi. And uh, we will present you the uh, product our recycle category. First of all, we start with the rugby ball. It's a, it is a tire uh, rugby ball made of tire material, recycled tire material. You can see rubber tire material. And the football makes same material, tire football, uh, print, uh, have a printing. And have a more wooden items. First, we start with the Tumble tower, recycle tumble tower. And a hooky. We have a line of products that are made of recycle items. It is a beach paddle bat made of the joint of the wooden. If you can see, there is a joint between the lines. 
Dominoes. This is a made of recycled. Oh, did he freeze? He, yeah, he, he, I think he just freezed. Well, it's very interesting that he has a lot of um, product made from re recycled material. I heard um, recycled tire, and the, it looks like some construction wood, wood that he uses there. Okay, well, Sabir, can, you can you hear us? Can you hear us, Sabir? Let's okay, just give well, him a, a minute or so. Let's just give him a minute. Let's see if he can join back. Because they came well prepared with all of the yes. products and they've got like really cool products they want to show. So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, because uh, um, eco friendly products are so hot right now, and it looks like his product is right in the market now. Yeah, oh, okay. he's dropped out. So, <laughs> yeah, let's just move on to the next supplier and then we'll just maybe do them after this supplier. Yeah, okay, um, sure. Let's invite uh, Rosie. Hi, Rosie. Can you hear us? Yes. Hello, Karen. Hi, Hello. hi Rosie yeah. and Renan. And we yeah. have Magla here with us as well. Um, so can you give us a quick introduction about your product and then uh, about your company and then your products? Yes. OK. So we can start now. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Rosie. Today, I'm very glad to be uh, on this meeting with you. My name um, my company name is Harpro Simic Saigon. It's founded in 1991 uh, with, with, our, um, with over 30 years experience in sport handicraft. You can see around me is our product. And uh, on the board behind me is the certification that we have attached for our factory. And uh, here yeah. is our retail standard that we have uh, already passed for customer, especially for US market. We have um, we have got uh, over thirty years since nineteen ninety one. We have export to U.S. Mar market. We always be in our top two of uh, registered export company in Vietnam. We have two uh, factory, one for woven basket here. This is woven basket, and one for ceramic item for ceramic plant support. Uh, but sorry, this is uh, our showroom woven basket. So we can show you the planter part. We export a planter part to U.S. market uh, too much. Um, around uh, 60, 60 containers per month. And um, for the lead time uh, of uh, for the lead time for one forty fifth container is around uh, 60 days. Our strength of a company is uh, we have a um, professional designer team and a sale department we, we we can catch on most of uh, buyer demand you can see around me is as our product is very eco-friendly very friendly with environments uh, so we are looking forward to having new more customer and new partner to try and build a wonderful offering thank you for listening That is amazing. I just love your products, Rosie. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and the presentation. Yes, you presentation can see. Was awesome. in, in the, yeah, in the left, right is the Golden Kitchenware uh, by Acacia and Robert Wood. Uh, we can produce, uh, we can uh, produce uh, almost of item for a kitchen. Yes, it's made by uh, Robert and uh, Acacia. We also have uh, the virtual showroom and uh, so you can click our uh, website to see to uh, visit our virtual showroom yes very interesting i like those baskets at the top of the shelves they're so cute yeah, and the right, <laughs> the, the, the right hand is a basket yeah this is a uh, um, made from the, the the natural fibers so very eco-friendly nice yeah, and how is and the packaging the done for the baskets? How is the packaging done, Rosie? The the packaging. Yes. Yeah, yeah. we we pack in a um, carton, master carton. Yes, and loading in container to export. Uh, all of our customer when receive 
the 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 container they also comment that the quality is good no damage yes and it's very sustainable for your uh, in in the barrier weather it's not damaged yes okay. that's good let's see if we have any um questions well we have a comment interesting product rosie that's that's possible. Yeah, thank that's you. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, we have another question from Rash. In which district is your showroom located? Uh, our showroom is located in Ho Chi Minh City, in the center of the city. So you can very uh, so it's a very easy to visit our showroom. Um, and we have also a bigger showroom in our factory in Bing Yung province. Okay, so Rash, just reach out to Rosie, and then I'm sure you guys can arrange a visit in the showroom soon. Yes, yeah, so okay. You. Yeah, we also have the virtual room. showroom. We have also the virtual showroom. Yes, virtual showroom. So you can see, uh, you can click the link to visit on the showroom here. It's very nice. Okay, so um, great to see you, Rosie. Thank you very much for your presentation and cool products. Yes, thank you for yes. listening. Thank you. We'll see you around. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Wow. Another equal product. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Really good variety. And I really like how the presentation that she had done. I mean, she's sitting in her showroom with all the products around her. So I really like how some of the suppliers are so well prepared to present their products. Yes. And the range is just huge. Okay. Let's see if Sabi is back that's a beer are you okay now yeah I'm, yeah okay you can? <laughs> yes we can okay thank you thank you okay okay you can continue on with your presentation yeah. this is the recycle wooden dominoes we have made I have printed on them laser printing Also have a wooden chest set and men's have laser painted on them. This is a made of the joint ply. You can see a laser painted on them. The article. I also made the cricket bed. This cycle. This cycle wood joint from the different part. If you can see. Scatter set wooden. Hmm. Sabi, may Thanks. I know? May I ask? Um, where do? You, where is your usual market? Where do you export to the most? Uh, uh, do. You... Uh, we don't have only one uh, export country. Uh, we sell different. Uh, last time we uh, sell uh, rubber tire football to Germany. And oh, to beer. Germany. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, we also have we also have uh, sell them the recycle uh, box, recycle corrugated box. Mm -hmm. This is a made made of the uh, waste material, and join them. Okay, so you also make boxes. Yes, this okay. is the football box. Packaging oh. materials. It's also from recycled material. Yeah. Oh, that that's good. That's good. So your product and your packaging are all equal friendly and made from recycled. Yeah, yeah. We have start uh, started from uh, last year. So uh, and also uh, uh, sell the canvas bag, who is eco friendly. Reusable, uh -huh. embroidered on them. Yeah. Also can print on them. I have a cup set. Also have a croquet set, joint croquet set made of two, three joints from recycled wood.
Yes. Yeah. So do you, do you have do you have like a catalog that people can request from you or um or you um cuz you have a website with us obviously and it's being shown on the screen right now globalsources.com/handrash.co um yes. I'm, if people are interested in your product they can sure visit the website or um do you have a catalog link or something that we can help you send out or help you promote as well yeah we have a catalog we have a different yeah. kind of catalog yeah, and because so I, I see you have a huge range of product and yeah. it'll be too much to show right now. You have you have a lot of product and they're interesting because um, eco um, recycled products, um, eco product, I should say, um, are very hot items now. And I'm sure it'll be a good potential for all our sellers. Yeah, thank you. OK, OK, so well, thank you very much for the presentation. And for those interested, please do visit Han Hanrash um, website that's shown on the web on the screen right now. Yeah. Thank okay. You so much. Sabir, good to see you today. Okay. Yeah, bye. Thanks, Sabir. Bye. 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 Okay. Well, he has a lot of good product. But it's too much to show, but <laughs> so <laughs> yes. unfortunately, so p please do visit his website and see more. Okay. <laughs> okay. Next up, we have. Shami, equal accessories. Let's um, add him up here. Hi, Shami. Hello. Hello everyone. Us? Yes, Hello. Yes, you? yes, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Great, great, great. Okay, um, so as mentioned before, you have five minutes. One minute for a yep. company intro and then your products. So Eco okay. Accessories India is an Indian-based export-oriented company established in 1999. And our main products are beach towels, round parios, kaftans, uh, ladies' garments like uh, kaftans, tunics, off-shoulder dresses. And our company is uh, BSCI certified, so we are social compliant and we follow all the rules and regulations of the land. And our U USP would be that uh, we also do small customized orders with a minimum order quantity of 100 pieces. So uh, people who uh, want to first test our products in the market, they can place a trial order as well. And we also have a wide range of qualities to choose from for, for like cotton, viscose, polyester, and silk. And now I'll showcase uh, some of our products. So here we have a cotton uh, kaftan, which is which can also be made in organic cotton. And this over here is a handmade uh, hand embroidery uh, we can also do like 50 pieces 100 pieces of this product over here we have a digital printed kaftan uh, it's a free size kaftan and uh, it's the length is 90 centimeters it's digitally printed so we can also do like 50 pieces and this one is in the viscose same thing kaftan uh, free size again Uh, this one I have here is a cotton printed kaftan. Uh, so you have a rope over here as well to uh, adjust your kaftan. And uh, we can also customize your kaftan with uh, tassels on the bottom like this. And uh, now I'll show you our uh, most selling item, which is a beach towel. So uh, the unique part about this towel is that uh, so it has got a pario on the front and on the back side it has got a cotton towel. So uh, you can use this to lie down on the beach to take a sun bath and at the same time you can wipe yourself if you would like to go and take a shower or anything. And the best part about it is that you can also use this as a yoga mat as well. So it's a multi-purpose towel. And we have a wide range of uh, designs and qualities in this. This is the backside towel, and this is the party in the front. The size of this is uh, 90 by 180 centimeters, so it's a huge size.
and you can also uh, we can also make bags for the towels so you can keep your towel in the bag as well so yeah that's about it uh, i think it's under 5 minutes <laughs> Yes, but, um, I like that towel, and those look so comfortable. <laughs> yeah, very interesting product. I, uh, you know, it's like a two-in-one multi-purpose product. Uh, very interesting. So, yeah. which markets do you mostly export your products to? Uh, so, the uh, main market is the European market. Uh, places where uh, there's a lot of beaches, like uh, Greece, Spain, and then uh, uh, we have our uh, buyers in uh, sub U the parts of US as well, like Miami. Yeah, so that's um, and now we also started selling in Australia and New Zealand as well, small quantities. Okay, okay. fantastic. Okay, anyone has any question for, for the nice towels? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, uh, so I heard that you you can make it in quantity of fifty or a hundred, right? So yes, it's like, uh, it's really, yeah. yeah. Yes, so it'll be uh, good. No, to try out. So we have a lot of customers that you know want to uh, first try the product in the market. So for that reason, uh, we make 50 and 100 pieces as well. And once they like the product, then they uh, have repeat orders, which are bulk quantity. So we are open to small orders as well. But nice, can they do customized good. prints for small orders or do they have to choose from your standard available fabrics? We can do customized prints as well, but we, that will be a digitally printed customized. So uh, we, the customers can provide with their design and we can print for them 50, 100 pieces, not a problem. Okay, that's really good. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, Samin. Thank, thank you, you for have presenting. Namaste. Okay, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. I want Very interesting towels, towel. Though. Yeah. Yeah. That looks so interesting. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> it's like yeah. two, in, two in one product. Very cute. Because I really hate it when I have to bring so much stuff to the beach. And then yeah. we have one of those two in one, then it's really good. Okay. So up next. So, yeah. Up, up next, we have Fanny, right? Uh, are we done with all the suppliers? Yep. Yes. Okay, we cool. are. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to invite Fanny from Seller X on screen. Hi, Fanny. How are you doing? Hi, everyone. Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm doing well. Thanks. Hi. Cool. Awesome. So Fanny is from Seller X, and this is a sponsor spotlight session. It's going to be a short session, and uh, Fanny is going to introduce Seller X to us and uh, tell us a little bit about what exactly the company is all about. So uh, I'm going to share your slides, Fanny, and over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so hi again, everyone. Uh, my name is Fan Yi, and I'm from SellerX, the investment team, and very happy to have the chance here to meet everybody virtually. Uh, I think this is the best we can do in this difficult time. Uh, yeah, to, to maybe um, uh, introduce our business model to you and see what we can help during your entrepreneurship uh, journey. So Seller X, so we are a, a Germany-based company, uh, though we have like 11 locations all over the world, including the States and also China and all across Europe. Uh, we are buying an e-commerce business. Um, so to be specific, uh, right now we are focusing on buying Amazon FBA businesses, but we also work with Shopify sellers, uh, eBay sellers, EC sellers. Um, so um, as a business owner, you may wonder after two, three years, four or five years of dedication working on the business, uh, maybe you come across with a bottleneck um, that you get tired or um, it, it just simply takes too much for you to grow the business to another level. Uh, at this stage, we would very much love to come in and to, to take over the business from you to, to, to find a good home for your business for the, for the next journey. Um, so we work with businesses, um, FBA business, Amazon businesses, or general e-commerce business that between that I have the revenue between 1 million to 10 million, uh, 15 million uh, dollar revenue and with 20% up margin. So these are the group of sellers that we work with. Um, here you can see that we have successfully raised over $750 million in the past uh, one year and a half uh, to acquire those business and to grow those business afterwards. And we also backed by the most no uh, notable um, VC investors, PE investors all over the world. Yeah. Um, if we can move on to the next. 
Yeah, here are some key figures. Um, so in the past year and a half, we have worked with over 40 plus uh, brands, uh, uh, business owners to acquire their brands and their 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 shops. Uh, we have over 750 employees over um, all over the world. Yeah, we raised the $750 million and we are in 10, 10 locations worldwide. So we can move on to the next. Yeah, here's our leadership team. Um, so we have obviously uh, people from the both investment and also e-commerce um, side. Uh, Philip, uh, he's our co-founder for and in charge of the investment side. He's from Goldman Sachs and also a um, big PE fund before. Um, Max and Jens are the two leaders from the KW Commerce, um, the big acquisition we did end of last year. Um, they were uh, top top like worldwide top 10 uh, largest Amazon sellers. And Malta, um, our co-founder on the select side from um, also was um, very experienced in e-commerce in general. So these are our leadership teams. And uh, we also have very experienced ops teams, investment teams to help everybody um, alongside the journey to, to, to find a good exit for your business. Yeah, if we can move on to the next. Yeah, here, this is actually one of our sellers. Uh, if every, if anybody's interested, you can check on his story um, on sellerx.com, like our website. Um, he he has sold his business to us last, uh, uh, end of 2020, actually. He's a German seller, and now he's using the proceeds to invest in his next journey. So we want to um, see more successful stories like this. So feel free to check our website or get in contact with the team. We would uh, very much uh, love to hear stories from you and also happy to give a free evaluation um, to help you to, to think about this exit opportunities. Um, so if we can go on the next, yeah, I think here, um, my other colleague, Carla, uh, may will share this in details. Um, this is just to give a quick overview on how would we improve or how would we operate the business after taking over? So obviously there are four things um, very keen to um, putting more value to the business after acquisition. So the first is operational efficiencies. So we're talking about anything from marketing to supply chain to branding. The second is regional expansion. I think this is maybe one of the most common, uh, say, headache or um, difficulties that many sellers come across is, I have a successful uh, products that are selling very well in, in the States. How do I expand to them to Europe or to Japan? Uh, to anywhere that Amazon is selling or vice versa. So this is something that we we work on very quickly after we acquire the business is on the gen, uh, re regional expansion. The third one, channel expansion. Yeah, how do I go from Amazon to Shopify to ET to other um, and also offline channels? Um, so this is something that we will work on as well. And normally um, could be a bit difficult for individual sellers to untap those big marketplaces or offline channels. And the, the, the fourth one is obviously product launching. Uh, we want to add new variants, new products constantly to the portfolio. So um, this is something that we would like to work on. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, also a short story on one of uh, the sellers that we worked with last year. Um, they own a supplement business called Ophic Nutrition in the States. Um, very young sellers, and they they also uh, was a very quick process in in general. Um, and we did um, here three things uh, right after acquisition. So five launched the five new products. We also launched a uh, uh, Walmart from Amazon. And uh, over the result uh, over over the year in 2021, we see over 140 percent growth on top line. So we can work on the next, yeah. Um, so so this is in general um, when you when you think about the business, go how 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 much it will go forward in the future. Maybe you want to choose a, a trustworthy partner to work with to bring the business to the next level and and also prepare maybe for your new um, entrepreneur journey. Um, so this is uh, when when we're coming and uh, again very happy to have a conversation with anybody who's thinking about selling in the in the next month or, so, or even in the six month time. Uh, very happy to make the connection here and help you to 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 go through the journey. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, very happy also to share a bit on the process, um, how 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 it looks in the acquisition, um, in the in the in the acquisition case. 
Um, so in day one, uh, we want to have a genuine conversation with you to understand what are you come from, what's the story of the business, what do you need at this point of time. And uh, um, in the next week, from say day five to day day seven, uh, we would work on uh, an acquisition uh, structure that works for you, that is truly tailored. And we would offer like valuation, also letter of intent for us to go into this um, uh, exclusive due, due diligence phase. So the due diligence phase is the third step. It generally lasts, um, say, uh, around four weeks, where we, we need to get to know um, your business in details, for example, from supply chain, the the arrangement that you have with suppliers to how you do marketing, what's your brand envision for the future. So that's the due diligence topic that we would generally cover. And by end of uh, fifth or sixth week, um, it's a successful sell. So uh, you will get the proceeds upfront payments in the, in the bank account, and then we will start tran uh, uh, tr transferring uh, like the seller accounts to, uh, to our company. And in general, we, um, we, we expect the sellers to work maybe three to four months after closing the deal with us um, to, to transfer all the responsibilities, to transfer your knowledge on the, on the products to us, to transfer your vision on the brands to, to our ops team. Um, so that's the 12 weeks after closing uh, part. Yeah. So in general, it takes, uh, yeah, four to six weeks before closing and then 12 weeks uh, as a transition period after closing. All right. So that has been my uh, presentation. Yeah. Uh, happy to take any questions or, um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for um, that overview. Very, very helpful. So guys, let us know if you have any questions uh, for Fanny about um, Seller X and uh, we'll be happy to take questions as well. And as she mentioned, they are offering a free business evaluation. So in case you are looking to, um, you know, get your business evaluated, even if you're not ready to sell yet, even if you're going to be yeah. ready to sell maybe in the next six months or so, just get in touch with them and um, see what you can, uh, what they can, how they can help you. It's very interesting that you talked about KW Commerce and uh, the yeah. founder of KW Commerce was actually a Global Sources Summit attendee, uh, yeah. maybe in 2016 or so, he attended a few of the sessions and then he came back as a speaker as well to the yeah. summit. So yeah, he's he's uh, he's got an amazing journey and an amazing story of how they have grown to be like such a, such big sellers on Amazon. Yeah, we're also very thrilled that we we, we got this acquisition um, successfully closed and also happy to be the one that they, they choose to cooperate with to bring KW also to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. There was one question that somebody asked uh, previously when Carla was presenting from SellerX, and maybe I'll ask you the same question. Which sure. categories are growing super fast nowadays or which categories are you guys most interested in acquiring? Yeah. Um, I think there, um, so the short answer is any evergreen category. So um, the things that we see doable, sustainable customer demand uh, over the time um, that don't necessarily face a lot of technology upgrade risks. Those are the things that we would like to work with, say anything from home to pet to baby. Um, I think particularly these two years um, in the States, especially because of the home office, because of the COVID lockdown trend, a lot of, like I think DIY or home and kitchen niche seeing a lot of growth and also the two, two, um, two uh, auto parts or two uh, niches where um, everybody needs to take care of all the things at home by themselves instead of going to garages or to, uh, to, to call service partners on this. So these are the categories that experience a lot of growth during COVID. And we're, um, but we're also carefully monitor um, how, how sustainable those peak or those faster growth can, um, can be. Um, but yeah, in general, anything uh, from home to baby to pet to supplement um, interesting products, good quality products with good reviews um, that we would like to take a uh, look on. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, Fanny, thank you so much for your time today uh, and for sharing all of this information about Seller X. And thank you, Seller X, for uh, sponsoring Global Sources Summit, for being our partner. We really appreciate it. So thanks a lot, Fanny, and we'll see you around. Thanks. Thanks, Magda. Thanks for the team. All Ciao. right. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Okay, so uh, let's move on to our final segment. And this is the most exciting part, <laughs> isn't it, yeah. Karen? Yeah. 
Yes, it's happy time again. <laughs> it's happy time again because it's quiz yes. time and prize time. But before yeah. we go into the quiz, uh, we want to talk a little bit about um, our Global Sources um, rewards and uh, Sourcing Club rewards. So let's quickly take a look at a short video about Global Sources Sourcing Club rewards. Sourcing Club rewards from Global Sources. Reward yourself for the hard work you put into sourcing. How? Simple. As a member of the Sourcing Club, you earn reward points when you do different sourcing activities. Then you spend those points to claim gifts. How do you become a Sourcing Club member? Register for a free account at globalsources.com with your email address and contact details. Your sourcing journey begins immediately, and you'll get reward points along the way. Sending a request for quotations or information. Placing a sample order. Scanning an exhibitor's badge at a Global Sources trade show. Sharing on social media. Placing a direct order on the Global Sources mobile app. All these actions and more will earn you Sourcing Club reward points. When you're ready to cash those points in, you can redeem them online for your choice from a range of gifts, from cash rewards to attractive electronics and lifestyle products. Start earning Sourcing Club rewards right now. Visit GlobalSources.com and click register. That is very awesome. I think it's so cool that you can actually source products, you know, like you usually and do and points. you get rewards. Yeah. And I want to add to that video is um, if you complete our survey at the end of the summit, the first 50 participants will actually get reward points as well. So please do submit your survey after the summit and you will also have a chance to win a cash voucher to uh, our platform as well. Awesome. Okay. So let's get let's get moving with the quiz. So now um, yeah. we are going to be giving away four prizes, and uh, we're going to be asking questions. The first person to answer correctly is going to be the winner. So for the first prize, this is the first prize: one hour consultation with Steven Selikov, worth two hundred forty nine dollars each, and this is for two people. So Stephen, of course, as all of you know, is super, super, super experienced when it comes to sourcing. He's been doing it for decades now. So an hour with Stephen, if you're stuck with your sourcing or product development, will uh, help you get unstuck for sure. Okay, so are you guys ready for your question? Okay, here it comes. Name the city in Guangdong province that is known for producing electronics products. So this is in China. Which is the city that is known to produce electronics products? So I'm sure a lot of people will get this. I think I'm um, giving easy questions or maybe two yeah, easy questions. Yeah, and we had a supplier from there this morning as well. Exactly. Is any, Let's see if there are any correct answers. I don't see any answers yet. There is a slight delay from the time that we broadcast and from the time people actually see. Okay, and we oh. have a winner, <laughs> Urban oh, Elish and Jen. Yes, you're right, Urban. Congratulations. That is absolutely the correct answer. And Urban, if you could please send us an email at summitinfo at globalsource.com. Uh, let us know that you won this uh, prize and then we'll get you connected with Stephen. All right, that was pretty awesome. Let's go ahead and go to the next question. Now, this is also for an hour consultation with Steven Selikoff for $249. Are you guys ready? So now this is, again, an easy one. And if you're selling on Amazon, you should know this uh, for sure. What does PPC stand for? So when you're selling on Amazon, there's a lot of Amazon PPC that people talk about. So what exactly does PPC stand for in so I see that people are now actually um, commenting on the previous question. Okay, who's got the first oh. one? Let's see. Yeah. Yes, Amazon. Amazon has got the first uh, answer, pay-per-click. That's right. So Amazon, if you could um, send us your, um, or send us an email at summitinfo at globalsource.com, then we'll connect you with Stephen. Awesome, awesome. I see a lot of people are answering this question. I think this is, yeah. <laughs> this is quite an easy one. So I see uh, Andy, Allison. Guys, you've got to be faster, quicker, fastest fingers first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay. So let's move on to the next prize. And this is one free ticket to China Sourcing Workshop worth 299 US dollars. 
And uh, we mentioned previously China Sourcing Workshop is going to be held in March. What are the dates of the workshop, Karen? Do you do you know? In Asia time, it'll be um, 19th and 26th morning. So it'll be Saturday for Asian. And it'll be um, Friday nights for the people in the States. So 18th and 25th okay. in the States. Okay, fantastic. So this is a two-day workshop that is uh, hosted by Stephen Selikoff. And he really talks about the A to Z of sourcing from China, including you know, vetting suppliers, negotiating. And he also talks a lot about selecting the right product because he believes that if you don't select the right product, then it's very difficult to be profitable. And so he also talks about how to get that um, you know, five to seven X multiplier that he always um, talks about. Andy saying two finger typer. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Okay, so here comes your question for one free ticket to China sourcing workshop. When you're selling on Amazon, should your A cost be high or low? What do you want to target? Do you want to target a high A cost or a low A cost? Let's see if um, anybody knows the answer to this question. And of course, people who are selling on Amazon, they would know the answer, but let's see who gets it right. Low, uh, <laughs> low, <low>, rash. <laughs> Oh, or is okay. It Raj, Raj was the first. Wait, wait. Yeah. Let me see who was the first. I see so many people. Okay, Raj. It yes, Raj. it is Raj. Yeah, it's Raj on our yeah. uh, screen over here. So, Raj, congratulations. Yes, that is the correct answer. A cost is um, uh, advertising cost of sales. So of course, you want a low A cost because you don't want to sell too much, spend too much on PPC to get sales. So, Raj, please send us uh, an email at summitinfo at globalsource.com and uh, we will give you your free ticket. Okay, last prize coming up, and this is a $300 voucher for globalsources.com, and you can basically buy stuff on Global Sources, right? Correct, Karen? They can actually go and buy products. Yes, is that correct? exactly. It's just, it's just cash, vo cash voucher, no limitation, Just you can just use up the 300 and good to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So you can buy products from Global Sources suppliers using this three hundred dollar cash voucher. If you want to get yeah. samples, for example, you know you could uh, probably buy samples or maybe a small order. Okay, yeah. here is your question for three hundred dollars voucher on GlobalSources.com. In which city does Global Sources host their sourcing exhibitions? This is also an easy question. And some people over here I know have also visited the exhibitions. <laughs> <laughs> so where does Global Sources host their exhibitions? Let's see who's the first to answer this. And acronyms are okay. We'll, we'll accept acronyms. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, oh, wow. okay, who's the first one? Um, oh my gosh, it's Raj again. <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> uh, yes, it is Raj. Oh, there we go. Say Andy, you used two fingers to type so many words when Rash is type HK. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Raj took the shortcut. I think everybody else typed yeah. in uh, the full the form full... Hong Kong, but Raj was like, yes. <laughs> Raj, you're smart. Congratulations, Raj. So you have won two prizes. And um, send us an email at summit info at globalsource.com and uh, we will get you your $300 voucher as well. Awesome. That was so much fun. Um, I really like giving away prizes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. so with that, we come to the end of this session. And we're going to be back with another jam-packed session tomorrow morning. If you're in Australia, we start at 10 a.m. AEDT time. And if you're in the U.S., let me get it right. <laughs> so the U.S. <laughs> is... <laughs> so tomorrow, U.S. will uh, uh, start at their... 7 a.m. Well, actually, that's our 7 a.m. <laughs> for Pacific <laughs> time, it'll be 3 p.m. And then for Eastern time, we'll be there 6 p.m. So it'll be in their afternoon and evening tomorrow for the okay. people in the States. Yeah. Can you show the email again? Yes, Raj. Let me just show the email again. So it's, uh, you want to, maybe you can take a photo of this. So it's summitinfo at globalsources.com. So, um, yeah, tomorrow's session is going to be jam-packed, and we've got um, uh, quite a few presentations. We've got Amy Wiest is going to be talking about advanced strategies for finding better suppliers. We've got Tim Jordan, who's going to be talking about sourcing in Mexico. 
And uh, that is, of course, very, very interesting. It's something new that a lot of sellers are looking into nowadays. And Tim Jordan and Amy are um, uh, also running a sourcing trip to Mexico. And then we've also got uh, Benjamin Hopwood from Gemba, who's going to be talking about how you can increase profitability and cut production costs. And we specifically asked him to cover this topic because this is just such an important topic for sellers around the world. And everybody's trying to um, you know, increase profitability and save a penny here and there. So uh, there's, this, this should be a very, very good in, um, presentation. We've got CJ Rosenbaum who's gonna be talking about how to prevent your supplier from selling your products on Amazon. Another issue that a lot of sellers face. Uh, so got to be a, going to be a very, very useful presentation. And finally, we're, we're going to be giving away uh, lots of prizes tomorrow. And we have one mega prize that is worth 1500 US dollars. We're not going to tell you what the prize is. <laughs> we're going to keep it a surprise, but it's going to be a mega, mega prize. And you do not want to miss this. <laughs> yeah. And Andy, you should practice your typing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> you're not going to want to miss that one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's a huge prize. And we were surprised, too, when, when uh, the person offered it. We're not going to tell who offered it or what the prize is, but let's keep it a surprise. <laughs> yes. Okay. Awesome. And um, Karen, real quick, what kinds of suppliers do you have tomorrow? Uh, for tomorrow, um, we'll have some, let's see, uh, We'll have some gadgets for air purifier, uh, computer related. And there's one really good one. We have some sterilizing um, gadgets for the home, for your bring arounds. And um, I think those are really interesting, actually, um, especially in the pandemic right now. And of course, we'll also have some eco-friendly items in the last session that'll be held tomorrow. We have a total of about, let's see, seven suppliers tomorrow. So do look forward to them. They will have some very interesting product. Awesome. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, we hope you enjoyed the presentations. We hope you uh, found them useful. And uh, we will see you again tomorrow at session three. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.